Hello, everyone. Um, let me take my mask off for this. Hello, everyone. Um, we're just going to go ahead and get started. Oh, no, actually, I think we're leaving it open just for better light, oh, if y'all are okay with that. Um, uh, just because we're running a little late, figured we'd dive in. So this is session 2B. Um, it's go time, practical lessons of implementing a digital preservation platform at GSU with Joshua Hogan and Rachel Sinise, thank you, okay. at Georgia State University. I have one of those last names too. <laughs> um, this session is a case study highlighting the efforts of digital library services and the special collections and archives at Georgia State University Library to implement a new turnkey digital preservation system during the summer of 2021. To ensure a more robust digital preservation program, the library chose to adopt Libnova's LibSafe Go, a simple to use product designed to create more, a more manageable solution. So without further ado, here we go. Hello, is this on? Maybe not. Hello? There we go. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> listen to the sultry sound of my voice. Okay. Hi, I'm Josh Hogan. I'm the Digital Preservation Archivist at GSU. And with me is... Hello, I'm Rachel Smith. I'm the Digital Projects Coordinator at Georgia State University. So welcome to our session. And I'll just get straight into it so we can get through all of this information. So um, before we get started, I'll just, I just want to quickly hit the, the context in which we were doing this project. Um, digital preservation is kind of a big word, a big term that we throw around. And I think that's more than just about technology. So while we're going to be talking about technology, we're also really talking about sort of a systematic approach to how we maintain our digital assets over the long haul. Uh, so digital preservation is in and of itself not about a particular platform. It's a platform agnostic sort of thing. It's about the tasks that you carry out, how you carry them out, who, who carries them out when they do that. So that's uh, sort of the background of this. Um, and that's, I think, very well illustrated here by the uh, NDSA levels of preservation. Um, what I like about the NDSA levels is that it's, it gives you something that you can um, use as a guidepost without necessarily saying everyone has to be at level four on every single thing. So if you're at level zero and in and, and terms of like maybe all you have is one copy of your digital assets. Um, that, you know, if you can get to level one, it's a huge win for everybody involved. Um, so um, anyway, just keep that in mind that while you might be able to get to level four with, with one of these turnkey solutions, getting to level one across the board is a great thing for someone who's not doing any of this material. So just keep these levels in mind. It's about you know, store, uh, functional areas such as storage, integrity um, of the files, control of your assets, knowing where they are, um, the metadata and, and all that. So there, there are a lot of different pieces to track and a lot of different level. It could be a different level for each of those. All right. And, you know, there, there are lots of different ways you can do this. One of the ways you can do it is to use a very standalone tool to do very specific tasks within the process. For example, you could use Bagger in the Library of Congress to bag your material up with its metadata and store it in several locations. Or you can use 6D Pro to make sure that you check file integrity and generate checksums and validate those checksums or Droid to uh, determine what kind of files you have. Um, there's also there just <laughs> represented exactly, which is a checksum program as well as Geimager, which is a, a disk imaging program. Um, if you wanna go more into suites, there are suites that are available more in an open source way. Uh, Bit Curator is probably one of the most well-known and has been around for a while. That was actually a project of Maryland's um, uh, Institute for Technology and Humanities um, and University of North Carolina Chapel Hill's uh, School of Library and Information Science that is now run by the Big Curator Consortium. This gathers a lot of those same tools that we talked about in the standalone 
and, but gives you to them enough a suite that you can then run a workflow through that suite, get some files that have been processed through those tools, and then put them into your storage solution. Um, Archivematica is another one that is actually maintained by a for profit corporation named Artifactual, but it's also built on open source tools and can be downloaded for free. But there's a lot of um, you know, total cost of ownership with something like that because you have to have a developer on staff to make sure that it works properly and you have the storage space. But Archivematica gives you a certain amount of automation to make sure that it does that. Uh, moving on to the, um, sorry, my, oh, okay. Um, another piece of this, like I mentioned, is you might do a lot of processing on your files using uh, file integrity checking systems or uh, any of the other tools we talked about, but ultimately you've got to find some place to store it where it's going to be safe. And there are storage solutions out there that are more robust than just having it on your local network. Some of those are like Meta Archive Cooperative and the Alabama Digital Preservation Network are what we call lock systems, a lot, lots of copies keep stuff safe type of systems. And those are managed to some degree because you have a server and multiple institutions and uh, you would deposit your file into the system and then it would get copied throughout various servers throughout a wide, a wide area, meta archive nationwide. Alabama is really Alabama and parts of Louisiana now. And DuraCloud is not a lock system, but it is a, a system that allows you to do backups of your local network. And it's in the cloud. You can get, get your uh, material back if you lose your material. And that is an important part of it. Um, and finally, uh, there are the proprietary platforms. And these are the ones that are attempting to be more turnkey that give you the whole solution. So you might have all your tools built in, you might have automation built in, you might have storage built in. Internet Archive is building one that's very similar to their archive platform for web crawling. Preservica is one that many of you probably heard of, um, probably one of the largest systems as far as being able to pay into the system and have all your tools and storage in one place. And then you see below are LibSafe Go and LibSafe Advance from LibNova. And that's important because that's really what we're going to be talking about is implementing LibSafe Go. And LibSafe Go is built in a way that we you can have multiple copies stored throughout the cloud and Amazon across a geographic area, which is another important piece of making sure that you have long-term uh, integrity and, and storage of your files. So uh, having set the stage, I'll turn it over to Rachel to get you into how we got to the safe go. All right. So we, in 2019 over 2020, Lisa Bellin and Christine Zayman, as well as library administration, um, applied for a grant from the Watson Brown Foundation to digitize all of the 16 and um, 8 millimeter Southern Labor Archive film. We didn't think we were going to get it. It was like pie in the sky, like, let's just try it. Let's throw this out there, see what's going to happen, and hope that something good comes of it. At the time, we were also advocating for a new digital preservation system, but we were pretty good at just kind of sticking in the status quo. So, our infrastructure at the time, um, we had a dedicated network drive located, located on our on premise um, SAM. So, we had three virtual machines, all the techy stuff. Um, we had our working drive, which was M. We had our archival drive, which was T. So anytime we would have digitized materials or more digital materials, we would put it on T, which was where we would um, keep it safe. And then that was backed up with your cloud. Um, content on our working drive um, server was backed up with out of warranty servers and some arbitrary software that you had to change the password every Every time you change your password for the university, you have to change your password for that too. That plays a key role in what's going to happen. Um, we had roughly 48 terabytes of allocated space between those two network drives. Um, we had about 35 unallocated terabytes of space on that SAM. So, go ahead. So, surprise, surprise, we got the Watson Brown. So we got the grant. It's great. And so because of that, we really had to reassess what we were doing because we had to figure out what we could afford. So myself, Lisa Bell, was a liberal archivist, Krista Graham, my boss, the head of digital library services, and Christine and Zayman got together and created a um, digital 
Preservation Recommendation Working Group. Um, at the time, Catherine Fisher, who was our digital preservation artist, had left. So we were working off of her notes and um, the systems that we had out there. So this is the QR code, the actual recommendation report. I'm going to go into a little bit of the details of it um, quickly. So, okay. so we compared a number of systems. We compared Let's Get Go, Preservica, um, back into LTO tape, because that's what our dean really liked, because Baylor did it, so he wanted to do it. And um, we also looked at what maintaining what we have, all of that previous slide. And we also looked at Perpetua. And we quickly rolled out Perpetua. <laughs> so we kind of um, ranked them. There we go. So we kind of ranked them, one being best, four being kind of the worst. And so the less points you have, the better, the better the solution was. And it really came down to Live Safe Go and Preservica. And we had a lot of discussions. It kind of felt like a WWD wrestling match sometimes when we had these conversations because. Some of us were very comfortable with Preservica. We used it before. Some of us were like, we want the new guy. We want the new guy. They're more willing to work with us. And we had to really do like a deep search on what our actual capabilities were. And so that's why we ended up choosing LibSafeGo through LibNova. Let me change it. Um, so the biggest thing that we took in consideration was they were willing to incorporate customizations into the implementation process. They were willing to work with us and they were not going to charge us tens of thousands of dollars to do these things. And we only have one programmer on staff within the library. So he was busy with a lot of other things. And so for us to say, Matt, I need you to create this entire customization and change this interface that you've never used before in a quick amount of time was not feasible. And so Livnova said, We'll do it. Like, oh, great. How much is it going to cost? So, like, we're just going to do it. They're like, we love you. You're fantastic. So, that was really one of the bigger uh, reasons why we chose them. And one of the things that we really wanted as we were evaluating all these systems was to integrate our Compton PM system into this preservation system. So that way, all of our metadata would be ported over to live with our files as well instead of manually exported and then saving it and then somehow figuring out a way to like disperse it across the files this way will actually have functions and it'll be built into the system to do it um we did have some concerns i mean the company is based in spain so depending on what service package we chose we would have to do any service needs between 3 and 12 a.m or 3 a.m to 12 p.m which isn't necessarily always feasible um, we definitely challenged that and they kind of gave up keeping their service times because we had a lot of, a lot of things that happen during this implementation. Um, and they also do not have a large user base in the US, so we weren't sure were they going to be successful. They have a lot of big users in Europe, but not here. And so we kind of felt we were taking the risk, but we felt like the strengths kind of outweighed the benefits or like the, the weaknesses. So we said, let's do it. So we gave a recommendation to the library administration in about April, they said, sure, let's do it. So we went through all of the pursuit, the uh, procurement procedures, the sole source and all of that. And we were, our contract was in um, legal hands. And so we were creating our plan. By this time, we had the Watson Brown um, films, which is called Watson Brown films, at Preserve South. And we knew that we were going to be getting roughly 100 terabytes of data over the course of this project. So good. So as we're doing it, yeah, sorry. Um, we knew that we wanted to prioritize ingesting vendor files from Preserve South. So instead of doing hard drives back and forth and then putting it on our server, then putting it on there, we wanted them to directly deposit that material so that way there was less transfer and less risk of um, errors happening. And then we also were saying, since our stuff is safe, we have multiple backups of our stuff on T, that's going to be afterwards. So, what do they say about best laid plans? They don't, they don't go well. Um, so, um, Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. It was not my fun season of Mayo. Anyway, it was not a fun day. Michelle can attest to that day. It was not a fun day. So, <laughs> Our library systems director, or not, our systems administrator, excuse me, um, we decided that we were going to expand 
because let's say if I was not going to be ready by the time we got the first batch done, we have to keep the project going. So we were going to expand our local um, network to take up those 38 terabytes, transfer the material, and then once we were ready, batch is like three. And the time we got to batch, they were like, we will go straight into the safe go. It'll be great. Um, that, that did not go great. So they attempted to relocate all that space. T drive went down. So we cannot access our T drive. And I got copious amounts of messages from Shelton saying, um, I can't I can't get to T. And then I was like, oh, I can't get to M. It's my working drive. It's fine. Trevor, what's going on? And Trevor's like, it's fine. It's fine. We're doing maintenance. So that went on a couple of days. And then it kind of became apparent that, yeah, we lost it. We lost all of it on that server. Uh -huh. It was very, it was a very fun summer time right now. Um, so pro tip, before you do any maintenance, make sure your backups are working. Um, big shout out to Sean Campos and then our students, Ben and Tori, for weathering that storm with me, because we had to figure out uh, how we were going to come back from this. So, so the aftermath. Dirt cloud, we still had a dirt cloud backup. Uh, there were six files that were missing out of that backup, so it was almost complete. So we're like, okay, we at least have our backup of T. Uh, BART, the out of commission server backup of all of my working files, had not been updated since December 2020 because the password wasn't changed. So remember, make sure the passwords are being changed all the time. Um, and so we were able to recover our spring or our fall semester. Spring semester was a little hit and miss on what we could recover from that server. Um, during that time, we were not very organized on how to handle this. So there was a couple of times that system in the church had to wipe and reestablish the server. And we're like, wait, no, no, don't do that. Let's not do that. Let's, let's stop that. We need to try to get some these files. Um, and so we also were like, oh no, we, we have this hard drive now of 14 terabytes that we need a home for. So Preserve Staff was very kind. They kept um, all our files on their servers as we were figuring all of this out. Um, and then we also fled to our central IT office to get one of their servers because we had no server and we had to have a place to put all our stuff. So it was a, it was a very hard time. So we ended up with three sets of data during this project. We had our dirt cloud backup, which was 36 terabytes, our preservation backup. We had the IIT server, um, which ended up being six batches of uh, film digitization, which is about 66 terabytes all through. We also had some of our older AD projects that were sitting on hard drives that just never got uploaded because of space and budget. And we also had our current digitization files and our hard files. We also have brought the preserved, that the preserved South data. So they had our backup of batches one through six, but they also had batches seven and eight. And they also had another AV project that we got that we didn't think we were going to get, um, which was digitizing our audio recordings through recordings at risk. So we had, we just were compounding data, not the greatest thing to do when we do digitization project or digital preservation project. And we also had patron requests for AV stuff. So we had a lot of data happening. So, um, so give it, give it, go back. Sorry. <laughs> um, Sorry. So with Nova and our kind of need was fabulous. Love them. They are my best friends. Uh, they saw that even though our contract was not signed, our data, our 36 terabytes that were now just solely sitting in Jerpa was at risk, they offered to facilitate that transfer for us. So we did not have to transfer it. They worked directly with their cloud and transferred all of our data, which I thought they did that because there was a lot of issues associated with that. A lot of the files um, did not automatically want to be rebuilt. So we were very fortunate that they did that. They didn't charge us to do that. They just knew that we were having issues and they were here to help us. So that's what was happening with all that data over the summer as we were trying to recover and figure out where we sit. So that leads into the fall 21, um, where we actually started the implementation process. So by then we had figured out our data locally. They had finally gotten all of our um, dirt cloud materials 
into um, what's we go and we have the shift gears. So now we're dealing with our archival data instead of our preservation data or our UAV data. So this is just a quick overview of the implementation process. We meet with them every other week and we have a travel board for any issues or thoughts and concerns and ideas that we have. Um, there's a lot of emails that go back and forth. Um, so when we asked them, like, what does implementation look like? They said there's no roadmap. It is dictated on what you guys need. Not helpful. <laughs> Not helpful. So they weren't my best friend at that moment. But <laughs> um, so yeah, so we're like, okay, we're kind of floating in the wind trying to figure out how we're going to implement this. So we have the data. We're like, we need to deal with this. We need to get our infrastructure in place. We need to just go and do it and figure it out as we go. So um, just a quick um, thing. This is the Navi and Let's Go. So everything is on a node base. So that is the highest level. So it's like the your area. area. And then we have like sub areas, and then we have containers that live in those larger categories. So that's just kind of the meta. So, so our implementation process was we move everything out of this one giant container because it's really big and it's low, and we need to get the state moved. So we, um, excuse me, we broke it down by what the old folders were, um, where they're going, who's transferring it. We also had what's getting transferred where. So the stuff that goes in hot, the stuff that goes in cold. So this was kind of a community of errors. As we were doing this, um, we would have moments where we would actually move the entire container instead of just a folder. So yeah, it's my boss's. That was my boss in there. It was a really fun one. So she went to go move a folder of about 100 hips, and she ended up moving 20 terabytes of data through the new function. It was really fun. So that was when we kind of busted the whole 3 a.m. to 12 p.m. service. Yeah, that, that went off the window because of those things. So um, that's kind of what we ended up doing for that. All right. So we did. Um, refine the process through all of this work. So when we were moving data, we would have to go to the new container, create a folder, go back, and start moving it. So what they said was we'll streamline it. We can actually create the container from the new function interface. Great, one last step. Um, we also noticed that the new function didn't tell you what you were moving. So we asked them, like, can you move like that so we don't accidentally move 20 terabytes again? Um, we also asked them to disable the fact that you can move every time. So they thought that was a good idea. <laughs> Look that. Um, we also asked them for a stop button. So if we were moving something and we realized that's not what we wanted to move, we can actually stop it. Um, we also have, because of all of our vendor projects, they have a lot of sidecar files with our VCOT. So we asked them for a function that will actually validate those, those for us instead of us actually having to do a manual check. And then we also um, had size limitation issues, both for submission periods, which we'll talk about later, and virus checks. So we kind of work with them on that. So in the spring, we finally got around to, okay, let's move the majority of our AV data and everything on our IAC server. So our central IT worked directly with Adobe, and they did server-to-server -server transfer. So we completely bypassed the whole Interface. You can't miss this one place when I do this. Um, so, completely bypass the interface. It was going to go a lot faster because, again, we had about 76 paragraphs of data. That took about three weeks. Just to reserve right. It was, it was fun. Um, we didn't move as much of the recovery files or the current user today stream project files just because the other ones were priority and we didn't want to slow down the system too much. To make that three weeks, six weeks. And then we also at this time started implementing submission areas. So we determined that we had two types of submission areas. We had submission areas for donors, which you can see on the right, and we also had submission areas for our vendors. So that would be Preserve South and Digital Library Georgia. 
So they ended up, ended up creating a node, like little sub nodes. So our vendors would have access to only that section, and then they could upload the files there instead of trying to go through this initial area where we had size limitations. So that was that. And then the Preserve South data, so they just transferred everything um, as like a user instead of as a um, um, donor. So that's kind of the quick and dirty of what actually happened during that part of the implementation. But well, we're not done. So once we actually get the data into, let's say if you're on one container and it's one node, we have to move it to the other node. So our data for the walk and browse stuff, IoT uploaded it into one container. We have more data on the other one. So we have to move all of that data. So it's MP4s, MOVs, waves, and DPX. Do not do DPX. We're doing a project, do not do DPX. This is bad my existence. They are very hard to work with. They are very hard to move. They are very slow to move. Um, and it is very easy to lose a file. So you can have a whole film and you're missing one, um, one film or one uh, image of that film. Very solid. So it was very fun making sure that we actually moved all of that properly. So um, here's the vendor submission area. So this is where they put everything in there. So I had to go through and actually figure out how I'm going to move this and how I'm going to monitor the movement of all of these files. So the tracking sheet where it had their notes to make sure like, is there anything weird about this one? Some of them didn't have some, some of them were found only. A lot of fun. So I kept track of moving that. So move it, how many files, when I did it, when I need to read that folder. And then when the XML and when the wave was moved. Um, this took me two months to do this for about 40 films, maybe 50 films. So it's a very long process because of those DPX files. So don't do it. Don't do it. Save yourself. <laughs> um, and then we also hit up on some system limitations. So with Safeco, so this is like a process for a terabyte a day. But we've been hitting that invisible wall. And that has really impeded our implementation because we kind of did this little backwards. Um, internet speeds for uploading material also is a bit of a factor. Luckily, IIT, when they uploaded all 76 terabytes, they were able to bypass some of the throttles and some of the limitations. But it still went very slow. And a file is not just a file. Again, a DPX file is way different than moving. A nice little word document and processing that super different. So you can't just think like, oh, I have thirty thousand files right here. It's really what are those files? What's the nature of that file? Is your processing? And then we also have lately found um, little tampons in the system. So some of our files that will move, it technically moved, but it's not showing in the interface, in the uh, front end interface, or it's created so many backups so that that we have like eight duplicates of a file that is hidden in the system. So that's been a fun, fun thing to kind of figure out. That's been the past week, actually. <laughs> um, and then again, functions not working properly. And we're saying, and Linda was very confused over why some functions not working properly. So we're kind of like their test, their test subjects in that way. So they're kind of fixing it as we go. And I always tell everybody when I'm the uh, interview. That will do. I break things. I break things a lot. So I'm great as your tester. So I broke it a lot. So those are just kind of like the system limitations that I'm ran into. Now, some implementation lessons. Document everything, every little detail that you're going to be doing this because. You will find a moment where you're like, we didn't do that. Is that how many files that we're supposed to move? Document it. Um, it will go wrong. It will most definitely go wrong. But work with your vendor and your developer to actually and be honest about what happened. Don't try and be coy and be like, well, I thought I did that right. When you actually didn't. Just be honest. 
like they're they're gonna know and it'll help them fix it faster. Um, and be explicit about what you need. This kind of contradicts the next one, but also you will learn things as you go, so you can also need to adapt. So what you think you need might not be what you actually need. But if you're explicit about what you think you need, they're actually going to tell you what you need. And more often than not, it works better that way. So I'm going to pass it on back to Josh. OK. Thank you. I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about some of the things that we've been working on and have happened since the system has actually been implemented. So this is, you know, we've got this digital preservation software. So you have to ask yourself, now what do we do with it? Um, because there's a lot more to it than just having software, as I said at the beginning. Um, and this is just kind of a, to represent the general idea of um, there are so many different kinds of tasks that have to happen in a digital preservation system and they have to happen in a certain order and certain people doing it. So you have to start coming up with those policies of what you're going to do, when you're going to do it, and how you're going to do it in the workflows, which is uh, a lot of what we've been working on since then. So it's really all about decisions uh, about uh, who's going to do what, what, how much time are we going to spend in, on this. Uh, very specifically, what kind of uh, visual assets are we actually um, committing to preserving in the long haul? Um, so the, you should ask yourself questions like, you know, what level of storage is needed in a system like Libsafe Go? You can set it up for hot storage, you can set it up for cold storage. That depends on whether it's going to be in one level of Amazon versus another level of Amazon. Uh, but what is that actually going to look like? Um, how will our patrons or our community members access these files? Are they going to go into our content DM system or are we going to make them available in the reading room? Is there another way we're going to do it? Uh, what kind of budget do we have for space on the servers? What kind of uh, budget do we have for expansion of that space over time? And how do we keep ourselves within that limit? Uh, which staff members are responsible for which activities? Uh, and which staff members actually have access to the system and how much access do they have to the system? Because that's, you know, we don't want to have another situation where we don't know what happened with data. Um, so, uh, in an ideal world, we'd have one workflow that rules them all, right? I mean, everything, everything we just pass through and the exact same thing would happen to them, but we know in the real world it doesn't really happen that way. And this is a workflow that um, I helped develop at the Atlanta University Center. Uh, several years ago, and, they, and then we had a lot less material than what Rachel did on an on daily basis. So we already had three streams that we we had to figure out how to get those all at the end to be uh, ready for long term digital preservation. So uh, we've identified se several scenarios, um, and these are ones that are going to be, I think, more in the day to day life of uh, digital library services and Rachel's team. But for one of the biggest things is um, digitization. So making digital sur surrogates of our analog archival materials, uh, such as photographs or, uh, or documents or videos on um, old style videotapes. Um, so before you take any of the steps that are listed here, um, or either the external steps on the, on the left side or the internal steps on the right side, it's imperative that a conversation between the curator or archivist at the curatorial area has a conversation with, with, with uh, digital library services, specifically with Rachel, because there's a lot to understand about how to make sure that the, the items are processed properly before they go on the content DM or before they get placed long term in hot or cold storage on their sit go. So the external workflows are really kind of external or at least. Uh, interacting with external people to uh, digital library services. Um, the previous conversation I mentioned between uh, digital preservation or digital projects coordinator and curator uh, will allow um, the, the correct containers to be created, the correct structure to be put in place, and all the steps that need to happen will happen. And as you see on the, in a way, uh, you, you have these external steps that in each case are going to be different for each scenario, but our internal workflows remain the same, such as whether we're going to create hot and cold containers, how we're going to upload those things, uh, validation of um, checksums 
and those sidecars, uh, creation of metadata, things like that are gonna stay consistent across different workflows. A second scenario would be vendor deposits, which uh, Rachel talked about in terms of like Preserve South or uh, Digital Library of Georgia. And you can see there's just a lot, a lot more stuff that, that happens here of different moving parts because normally we would be digitizing our materials, but when a third party comes in, there's a lot more that has to go on to make sure that the files meet the standards that we need them to meet to work within our system. But again, the internal workflow stays consistent um, and has a lot of the same moving parts. Um, patron requests is, you know, a, I guess a, a different thing altogether because we may not want to do a long-term um, preservation of what they ask for. So one of the first questions will be, uh, does this request go into LibSafeGo or is this just sort of a one-off thing? If it does go into LibSafeGo, do we already have a collection and how does this fit into the structure of that collection? So you have to really think about those things before you even get to the part of the internal workflows. So the tip here is that even though scenarios often diverge, keeping a consistency in your internal processes and, and the final product um, helps you maintain a sustainable digital preservation program. Uh, and then uh, the thing that, that really is more specific um, to, I guess, the day-to-day -day workings of what I do is dealing with born digital within the archival, <laughs> within our collections and archives. Um, and this, uh, this diagram really demonstrates all the different ways that we can get born digital materials. We can get stuff directly from our donor's computers. We can get stuff from their social media accounts. We might crawl their web page. Uh, we might download their email, that sort of thing. So there are a lot of different ways that more digital materials are flowing into our system. And we need to make sure that we don't screw up what Rach is doing by not having systems in place to deal with it properly and have it processed properly before it gets into the system. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and I apologize for the verbalness of this workflow. Um, for one thing, I am as good at um, graphic design as, I don't know, um, a giraffe that's been hit in the head. But the, so it takes me a long time to put these things together. But um, I don't expect you to read all this. This just shows the, the, the reality that we have two different scenarios already when we get into born digital processing. And one of those is being that we have the scenario where we have modern or contemporary media, such as hard drives, thumb drives, directly downloading things from the web, things like that, that we can easily access. And then on the other scenario, we have uh, legacy media that we might find when we're processing a collection that comes into us in boxes, we might find a whole folder full of floppy disks. And we have to figure out what we're going to do with the digital materials that come out of that. So that's that's going to give us two different things that we have to worry about now. Um, thankfully, after, you know, if you look at uh, the original uh, modern media, you know, in our ideal situation, we would want our donor to be able to log into one of those submission areas, put their materials in, give us the basic metadata, and now we've got a new system. That's where I come in and start doing some of those basic digital preservation uh, activities like virus checking, deduping of um, files, getting rid of file formats that we don't need. When it comes to the legacy media, I might get that material directly from the curator who's found it in one of their boxes. And then I have to get, <laughs> I have to take that to our pro digital processing station, see what's actually on it, have a conversation with the uh, curator about is this, is this something we want to keep? It might be, you know, an old shopping list that somebody's mom kept on, on the computer. So we may not want to keep that as part of our collection. But those can, if we do decide that we want to do that, that there has to be some processing that happens to that file before we even get it into the loop set go system. Um, so that leaves me to uh, just looking at some of the top things about tackling more digital material. Uh, so we want to ensure proper access accessioning of this material. It's easy for us to skip the part, to get our registrar involved. Um, sometimes in our excitement of getting materials from our donors, 
we might get them to give them directly to us as curators and then the registrar has no idea that new stuff is added and we don't have an accessioning record in archive space <laughs> we have to have that conversation make sure that it's in there um, in terms of born digital processing um, we have to you know have the correct nodes and containers uh, set up as well as the processing containers we've now set up a processing node for curators to be able to get into and process their files using tools and uh, let's say go as opposed to sticking it on a server somewhere and waiting forever for something to happen but also we don't want to stick it in let's say go and it's not been processed and have it in its final home um, and that leads me into LibSafeGo's processing tools, something that we want to leverage as we go forward. Um, and that will include adding tools for personal identifiable information, scanning for that, figuring out what we're going to do with it, and also figuring out how much time and space limits we're going to give to each curator to make sure that we get these things done in a timely fashion. Because as you all know, as we get more materials, before we can process the stuff we get, we get even more materials and that backlog happens in the digital world just as well as it does in the physical world. Um, legacy media issues in particular, I wanted to just uh, bring that out, is that uh, the tip here is to adopt a, a realistic and sustainable strategy for dealing with these, because as I said, you might have a bunch of floppy disks, but you need to determine what's on them in the first place and whether that's something that belongs in the collection and before you even do all that processing work. And we've even had conversations. If I find a floppy disk that has one word perfect document on it, do we really want to go through the process of doing the migration of all that? And now having a, a container floating around with one text file in it, or do we want to print that out and record that as what we've done to preserve it, put it into the collection folder? which is the more sustainable way in the long term, given our staff. Uh, so I'll, I'll let you do it. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to get through this really quick. So we have like a few minutes of questions. So we haven't covered a lot of what has been in the implementation process, despite my airing all of our dirty laundry. Um, so we haven't really discussed the actual decisions behind our collection structure and how we actually structured everything we to go. We also want to discuss reports, user permissions, storage policies, um, growth projections, and checking in and out containers. Like these are all aspects of the system that we're still working on. We also have to share at this point, but we're happy to. If you want to ask, we're happy to share. Um, and just as we were doing this, we really wish we had a case study for how other people were doing. And so if you want us to do your case study, we are happy to do it. Um, and then just we have some custom features that are kind of the future for what we're doing. Um, the content hand integration is currently being developed. We're testing it right now. I'll be testing it hopefully in the next month or so so I can actually see if it's working. Um, creating the virtual reading room, as Josh has alluded to a lot of times. Um, originally, within Let's Say Go, you can make files public, but you have to run a report and you just get a list of um, links and like the file. Name. And that's not necessarily helpful for some of our partners, especially if we are a repository for someone and they need to find a file. It's not, that's not very helpful for them. So we actually ask them to create a virtual reading room so the container in its entirety is public so they can download those. And so we can click a button so that this one's going to be public. They can actually go through it. Um, we have requested a kind of version two of the virtual reading room so that's making the container public without download. So if you have sensitive oral histories, they can listen to it, but they can't download it. Um, the born digital processing tool that Josh also mentioned, uh, the renaming tool, they implemented that very early on for us, but the PII scan has been requested and they're investigating it, as well as um, leaving duplicate files from a duplicate file report. So on the dashboard for each of our containers, there's actually a section that says, you have 30 duplicate files. In the case of my AV, they're like, you have 94,000. I don't actually, they were phantoms. <laughs> um, and so, what we are hoping to do is actually take that report, generate like a checklist next to it, say, okay, we want to delete A, B, C, and like F, and we want to keep C and D or whatever. And so, it'll actually delete it from there. It'll be a soft delete. So, Josh would actually have to like double check, make sure, like, yes, this is what we're going to be deleting. 
but it will help us figure out like what to do with all those duplicate files. And then we're also hoping to automate a lot of our workflows. So all those internal workflows, we're hoping to actually automate a lot of that. So the virus scan, as soon as we hit go to virus scan, it'll automatically run. As soon as we hit uh, validate, it'll automatically run instead of us having to press the button that says validate or file scan. So this is the future of kind of where we're going. There's a lot of that customization that again, we don't have to pay for it because they're doing it for us. So, and that is, that's it. This is our contact information. So if you guys have any questions or thoughts or concerns or great tool, I'm open to all of it. <laughs> so thank you for joining us in our crazy little roller coaster of your future preservation system. Is the container the same thing as an egg? And our final design that doesn't work. Uh, container could be set up for that um, okay. to represent that structure. So that's just a generic term, the container, you do something specific. Yes, yeah, so the container, I guess, would you characterize it? So that's where you actually put the content. So it could be your, your ape, could it live in a container. Uh, the node is just setting up the structure so that you can navigate all these containers. Okay. Like, can you the library? Who's the product owner or admin? I don't want to get you for that thing. Kind of a default. It's me. It's a um, digital library services software. So Special Collections uses it heavily, but technically digital library services owns it. So by default, it kind of falls to me. It's a very simplistic question because I'm nowhere near any of this level of technical concern. Um, you talked about Dermla being your permanent uh, preservation backup system. So that's what it was. That's what it was. That's what it was. Let me ask you about, was that um, at that point that you were using it, um, was that an automated backup that you had implemented or is that something that you have to go in I wasn't technically here when that was done. So um, it's it was automated. Um, there was a lot of trial and error in that automation, but it was automated. So it would run, I think, at the end of the day, it would just upload any new files. Um, when it was first implemented, it actually tried to rewrite itself a bunch of times. So that was a fun discovery that they had, my predecessor had, but it was automatic. It was just an automatic, um, it would send any new additions to the server and just automatically. So from there, that's where, because I was like, I was trying to follow the whole progression. <laughs> that's where then you went to the, let's say, go. So when we got to walk down the No, it's fine. It's a lot of information. Your entire presentation. No, it's a lot of information. I tried to like pack a lot of it in there. So we had Dura Space or Dura Club for about like five-ish years, I want to say. And it worked pretty well. Um, our system administrator was the only one who really had access to it. And so that's actually part of the reason why we lost his files is because he was given an error report and he forgot about it. Um, so we were using, again, Drip Hub for five years. Um, when we got this error, we're like, oh no, we, we did not plan appropriately for 100 terabytes. And so when he looked at what um, it would take to maintain what we had and just keep Drip Hub, um, the price is astronomical. It was astronomical. And we were, we just realized like we cannot sustain this. We also can't get in a server for our room. So I, the price to maintain what we have was easily over 100,000 a year. So, I mean, during cloud, we were paying between 30 to 40,000 a year for the 30 terabytes. I believe let's say go is around 46,000. So it wasn't that big of a price jump for us. And so that's why we felt it was pretty feasible. And it was like almost four times the amount of storage that we were getting with our pub. So that's ultimately why we went away from it. I don't have to hear that amount of data, but I mean, if, if you're coming in from the beginning, you know, like it's good to know what you did. <laughs> Well, probably ran up against. Yeah. 
And like the access issue with Nerd Cloud was an issue because if you do a lot of cultural things, like the system administrator is the only one who had access. Um, my predecessor might have when they were implementing it, but I wasn't there, so I can't answer that. So we definitely use that brand as the excuse to get a whole preservation system. Um, the actual platform itself for let's say go was about 20,000 and then we had 20,000 storage. So if you're looking to try and get something off the ground and just start a good like the highest level you can right away, it's actually not that complicated. It really isn't. And again, we have 200 terabytes of storage within our let's say go instance. It's about 150 in cold and 50 in hot. So, any more questions? Michelle, did I like traumatize you? <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, for the implementation team. <laughs> well, thank you for attending and again, being on this roller coaster with us. Enjoy lunch. Enjoy lunch.